No questions? Okay. Then let's quickly recap what we did last week. Um, we looked at theories of failure, both for ductile materials and for brittle materials. For uh, ductile materials, the two theories of failure that you should be using are the maximum shear stress theory and the von Mises or the maximum distortion energy, or the same. Uh, for the uh, brittle materials, you should be using either brittle Coulomb Mohr or the modified Mohr. And all of them, of course, entail uh, drawing a um, locus of failure point, or what we call strength lines and then drawing the load line, finding where the two cross. The results will give you the critical stresses or the stresses that will define failure. Then you can simply find your factor of safety by dividing those stresses by the applied st stresses. And that'll give you the uh, factor of safety. And we did some example problems. Let me do one more example problem for you. This is problem 523. <clears throat> it says for an ASTM 30 cast iron A find the factors of safety using the brittle Coulomb Moore and modified Moore theories B plot the failure diagram in the sigma a sigma b plane to scale and locate the coordinates of the stress state and C, estimate the factors of safety from the two theories by graphical measurements along the load line. We rarely use uh, graphical measurements in our analysis. We use analytical ways of finding, in other words, the equations, uh, finding <coughs> the results. However, uh, <clears throat> it is important for you to understand and be able to draw uh, a graphical representation of both the strength and the stress. And, and you should do this actually before you uh, start any calculations. Then you will have an idea, of course, provided you do it correctly, you will, have a, you will have an idea of what the factor of safety should be. So I'll do this analytically. I will also sketch a plot of the strength and load lines, and um, we'll try to estimate what the factor of safety is. So that's uh, for this problem, and this is general for a number of problems. This one in particular uh, will have the following stresses. Sigma x, 15 ksi, sigma y is 0, tau xy is minus 10 ksi. Uh, this, of course, is given uh, the state of stress at a point. Uh, in general, you will not be given these stresses, but you will be given a loading case from which you must identify critical points and for each of those points draw or calculate stresses like this. Um, so, since we've done that before through shear and moment diagrams and all of that, uh, we start from here. But you should be able to take the problem from the beginning to the end, and this is somewhere in the middle. If we uh, draw the uh, stress element at this point, Thank you. 
this is what you will be looking at. Now, a couple of points here. <clears throat> One, um, do you understand the meaning of that number 30, ASTM, ASTM 30? By the way, do you know what ASTM stands for? No? Okay. This is important. Um, I'll put it out here. Or, nah, maybe I'll put it out. American Society of Testing and Materials. This is the official body that tells you how to run tests. If we don't have an official body to specifically tell us how to run various tests, uh, different people will do different things. Uh, for example, if I want to run a test on some sort of steel, well, whatever I find downstairs, I'll test that. If somebody else tells something else. Uh, there's no way we can compare our results. So they tell you exactly what, for example, the length should be, what the diameter should be, what the surface condition should be. All of these are set forth in ASTM. This is not just for you know, tension and compression tests or tests in mechanics. They have it for everything, including soaps, shampoos, and anything else you can come up with. Next time you're in the shower, take a look at the back of your shampoo bottle. It probably says complies with ASTM, whatever the number is. So a, that's AS, what ASTM stands for. ASTM 30, when applied to cast iron, means what? Does anybody know that, what that 30 stands for? Percentage of the weight percentage of carbon. Uh, no. Um, <clears throat> carbon. Uh, it's a good thing you said that. Let's, let's talk a little bit about carbon. Uh, what's, uh, is there a maximum amount of carbon that can exist in steel? Of course, this is not steel. This is iron, but that's okay. Let's do steel first. In other words, can I have a steel made of 50% iron and 50% carbon? No. So does anybody remember what the maximum is? If you, got, you, you guys who have taken 315 should know that. No, 6.7 is actually for cast irons. That's the maximum amount of carbon that can exist in an alloy of iron and carbon, 6.7%. Specifically for steels, the amount of carbon in steels, theoretically, is limited to about 2.1%. And that's theoretical. If you get a steel like that, it is probably, not probably, it's definitely worthless. It is so brittle that you can't use it for anything. Practically, no more than 1.2 to 1.3% carbon can exist in steels. And those steels are very, very brittle as well, but there are some applications for those. Uh, so. <clears throat> the number 30 in this case, so we can't have 30 for carbon in any type of a steel alloy or iron alloy, be it steel or cast iron. Uh, the number 30 gives you the approximate tensile strength of the cast iron. So when you read ASTM 20, that means the tensile strength is approximately 20. 30 means it's approximately 30. And here they give you the uh, tensile strength, or you can find them. I don't know whether they give them to you here. You have to find them from the tables in the back of the book. And if you do that, this is what you get. ST equals 31 KSI. And SC equals 109 KSI. Tensile and compressive strengths of cast iron. 
and you see that ST is approximately 30 KSI. That's one point. The other point, uh, any questions on this before I go to the next point? The way I do these stresses, um, specifically this one, tau xy. What is this set of stresses represents stresses where? I don't mean where in the structure, but generally when we have an element, that element is representing stresses where? At a point, exactly. At a point, one point. Now, you can pick the point wherever you like, and you're going to come up with different uh, stresses for that point. But this is stress at a point. And if that's the case, then when we do more circle, we would consider this shear stress positive or negative. This one? OK. We're talking about shear stress at one point. How can it be both positive and negative? That doesn't make sense. Shear stress at a point? Shear stress at one point. That's it. should have one sign, period. And there's nothing wrong with the way we've represented these. Exactly right. Uh, to, we can actually draw more circle with a different type of definition, but it's very complicated if we do that. Not very complicated, a bit complicated. Uh, but to signify or represent stresses, and at any point, there are nine components of stress. So let me draw those for you. I'll leave that there. Stresses are among um, a group of entities called second order tensors. And all they do is transfer according to the equations that you know related to Mohr's circle. So let me show you the nine components of stress. Is this stress, uh, what should be the uh, Subscripts for that shear stress, tau. Y, Z. Why Y, Z? Uh, this plane is the Y, Z plane. That is correct. But that's not the Y, Z. That's actually X, Y. Now, you were told that it doesn't matter if you call them x, y, and y, x. And generally, in most problems, that's true. It doesn't. But each of these are represented with two subscripts. The first subscript, x in this case, um, subscript first direction of the outward normal to the plane on which the stress acts. And this is good, not only for shear stresses, but also for normal stresses. And it is the correct way of representing stresses. I'll explain what this means exactly. Second, 
direction of stress. So according to this definition, there are two subscripts here. The first one indicates the direction of the outward normal to the plane on which the stress on which the stress acts. What do I mean by outward normal? If you have this plane, you can draw a perpendicular to it going in that direction, or you can draw a perpendicular to it going in that direction. This is called the inward normal. This is called the outward normal. Everybody OK with that? Going away from the plane, outward normal. The second subscript, so that's x, direction of outward normal to the plane. The second subscript is the direction of the shear stress itself. So this is tau xy. This stress, first subscript, direction of outward normal, so x. Second subscript, direction of the shear stress, uh, sorry, direction of the stress itself. Sigma xx. Then we have another shear stress here. This, and this is what? Tau outward normal x, shear stress in the z direction, xz. Similarly, we will have this stress as sigma y, y. Uh, this stress as tau y, x. Oh, sorry. Tau z, x, not y, x. Z, x. Uh, I'm sorry? Sigma ZZ, yes, thank you. That's why I made that mistake, and then I made that mistake. Thank you. Sigma ZZ, tau ZX, and then this one, tau ZY. Same definition. Last plane, sigma YY, and this one. Tau y x, and that one, tau y z. The two-dimensional stress, uh, stress element that you draw is the one that's drawn when you're looking along the z-axis. So this is what you have when you draw that. You're looking in that <coughs> direction, so you get sigma x x, tau x y, Sigma xx here, sigma yy here, tau yx. Is everybody comfortable with this? That's the nomenclature for stresses. Now, <clears throat> the beauty of this is that it doesn't just name the stress. If you look at this stress with its subscripts and you have a set of axes, you can figure out whether the stress is positive or negative, regardless of whether it's normal or shear. So this is the way we do it. If the outward normal to the plane on which the stress acts, in other words, the outward normal in this case in the x direction, is in the positive direction of the x-axis, then we call that subscript positive. That's the case here. For the second subscript, if it is in the positive direction of the axis, we call it positive. The product of those two signs give you the sign of the stress. In this case, positive times positive gives you positive. Therefore, this is a tensile stress. It tells you exactly what it is. 
On the other side, you may be thinking on the other side of this face, the outward normal is in the negative direction of the x-axis, negative. The, shear, the normal stress itself is on the negative direction of the x-axis, another negative. That would be this one. That's my x and y. Negative direction of the x-axis, outward normal. Negative direction of the stress, negative times negative, positive. A tensile stress. Had this stress been reversed, we're a compressive stress. This one would remain as positive, that one would be negative. And then it would tell you that the stress is compressive. The same thing is true for all of these. And if you do that, you see that whether or not I draw a shear stress like this or like that, it's not that this is negative, that's positive, but they're both positive. For example, this one, the outward normal is in the positive direction of the x-axis. Shear stress is in the positive direction of the y-axis, positive shear stress. What about this one? Outward normal in the negative, shear stress in the negative, positive shear stress. What about this one? Outward normal positive, shear stress positive, positive. Outward normal negative, shear stress negative, positive. All of these are positive shear stresses. Even though when we use more circle, we plot one of them as positive and the other one as negative. We just do that because it's easier. There is a way to, to draw more circle using this convention, but we're not going to talk about that here. We'll just stick with the convention of more circle. But this, these are a couple of points that I think you should be uh, aware of. Any questions? OK? So that's how I drew this stress. It says tau xy is minus 10 ksi. The stress that acts on this plane is negative. The outward normal is certainly not negative. Therefore, the shear stress must act in the negative direction of the y-axis. And that's why it's drawn like it is. Does everybody understand that? Because given this set of numbers, should be able to draw that. So if there is anything murky here, please let me know. Any question? All right. So going back to the problem, we have this set of stresses. These are our strengths. And we would like to come up with some sort of a factor of safety for this cast iron. <coughs> to do that, we use failure theories. And in failure theories, we draw two-dimensionally. Uh, we draw the two principal, uh, principal stresses, sigma A and sigma B, for example. So we need to find the principal stresses. So I have sigma x as 15. And now I use more circle convention. And for that, that's positive. So that's 15 and 10. This is all in KSI. And then on the other surface, 0 and 10. 0 and <coughs> minus 10, rather. There's the diameter of more circle. And there's more circle. If you calculate the values, this is a simple more circle case. So I'll let I'll leave this up to you to come up with these values. Sigma A equals 20 KSI, and sigma B equals minus 5 KSI. So now we have the principal stresses. We plot our failure locus. They ask for us to do this using brittle Coulomb more and the modified more. This is sigma A. That's sigma b. 
mark ht here, so that's 10, 20, 30, and 31. And here, <coughs> this is 31 KSI. <coughs> That's also 31 KSI. Then, and notice we only use the first and fourth quadrant. The second and four, uh, the, the second and third are very similar. And this being, of course, cast iron and a brittle material, what's important are tensile stresses. So this one will go 30, 60, 90, 3, or 90 what? Oh, 109. 90, okay, we'll go down in here somewhat. That's 109. That's the brittle Coulomb more. Modified more. Draw that too. There's the modified more. Actually, let me make this dashed. That's not a part of the failure lo uh, line. Failure lines are the solid lines. OK. And let's plot our point and try to figure out approximately what the factor of safety should be. Our point is 20 and minus 5. So here's 20. So that's 10, that's 5, so we're over here. Uh, let's draw the load line in a different color. These two points identify the critical points or limiting values of these stresses <laughs> according to the two failure theories. Uh, so this is 20, and that's minus 5. They're all in KSI. Any questions? Everybody following what I'm doing? Estimate the factor of safety by looking at what's on the board. Remember, this is an estimate. You don't have to be exact. According to, first, the modified mode, because it's the easier of the two, because it crossed up here, not down here. Had it crossed down here, it would be a little bit more difficult. Graphically, how do you get the factor of safety? That length over that length, right? Which is the same as this length over this length. So estimate the factor of safety, 1.5, right? The exact factor of safety according to the modified Mohr theory, which is the easier of the two, 31 over 20. That comes out to be 1.55. Any questions? Now, the brittle Coulomb Moore, 
Of course, you can use the equations if nothing else is set, but I am not a real fan of just simply plugging numbers into equations. You need to know what you're doing and why you're doing what you're doing. So I will ask you to do the procedure that I went over last time, and I'm going to go over again today, uh, in order to find the factor of safety. Not in all cases, but in some simple cases such as this, I will ask you to do that. So to do that, what we, use, what we do is write an equation for the failure line, brittle coulomb more, And that is sigma A over 31 minus sigma B over 109 equals 1. You can check that equation by saying if sigma B is 0, sigma A is 31 there. If sigma A is 0, sigma B is minus 109. There, there's the line connecting the two. This is a straight line. Two points is all you need. The equation of the load line. This green line is a load line. And clearly, the equation for that is sigma A equals negative 5 over 20 sigma b. You have one point, and the line goes through the origin. We now solve these two together. When I solve these two together, algebraically, what will I find? Oh, did I? Yes, 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 it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is the opposite. Absolutely. Sigma B equals that times sigma A. Yes, as I said before, if you see anything that I write on the board that doesn't make sense, please say so. Um, you're either right, which is very, very good, because I'll correct my mistake very quickly. Or if you're not, I'll tell you why not, and then you won't make that, you won't make that mistake again. So. It's good all the way. Uh, so back to my question. If I solve these two equations together, I will, what will I find? Of course, I'll find answers for sigma a and sigma b, right? This is two equations and two unknowns. But what do they represent? Sorry? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Intersection, the coordinates of the intersection of the two straight lines, correct? That would be the coordinates of that point. Agreed? That's the point of intersection. That is the limiting value of these stresses. The limiting value of the stresses we called strength. So when we solve these two together, at the same time, we'll switch the names from sigmas to s's to, to signify strengths. So when we solve these two together, this is what we're going to get. And you only need one of them, really. You don't need both, and I think I've only found one. Find SA equals 28.9 KSI. So all you do is substitute this for sigma b and solve for sigma a, and that's what you get. The factor of safety, according to this theory, is this length divided by that length, which is the same as saying, that's SA, by the way. That's SA right there. Which is the same as saying N equals SA over sigma A, 28.9 divided by 20. And that'll give you n equals 1.45. And you expect to get a number similar to that. It certainly has to be smaller than 1.5. 
And you can estimate it. Maybe you look at it and say it's 1.3, but that's close enough. If you draw it to scale, you can actually get good values up to two significant figures from your sketch, which will be very helpful. So that's the factor of safety. Any questions? OK. So from now on, if given a problem and ask for a factor of safety or a maximum value of a load or something like that, uh, you should no longer be saying that the factor of safety is equal to the yield strength divided by the maximum stress. Although sometimes that's good, like in this case. But generally, you should be using a failure theory. So in this case, you say, I'm using brittle Coulomb more or modified more. And here's my answer. Done. OK? So that concludes a look at various static failure theories. And remember, these were all static failure theories. No speed of loading involved. Now we will take a look at pressure vessels. And what we say about pressure vessels, um, in many instances, is good for pipes as well. The only difference between a pressurized pipe and a pressurized vessel is that in a pipe, since a fluid flows through the pipe, the pressure is really on periphery of the pipe, not along the axis of the pipe. But in a vessel, you will have pressure around the periphery and at the two x, so axially. In other words, if you have a vessel, Due to an inside pressure, for example, the diameter increases, so will the length. Everybody OK with that? In a pipe, the diameter increases. Of course, other stuff will happen too because of Poisson's ratio, but we're not going to go into that right now. Uh, you study the case related to thin-walled pressure vessels. So I'll refresh your memory here. A vessel is considered to be thin-walled if its thickness is 1 20th or less of its diameter. So for that, this is what you must have. According to your book, now you may read numbers a little bit different from that. Uh, generally, that's pretty good. By doing this, we are, <clears throat> by saying that a pressure vessel is thin-walled, <clears throat> we are simplifying the calculations. But we want to make sure that what we have is, nearly, is not too far off from the truth. So if we can keep our errors below about 5% or so, then that's good. And it, it, is, it warrants the easiness of the problem. <clears throat> For such a pipe or vessel, there are two stresses that you studied in ME 219 called the tangential or hoop. stress. This is a stress that tends to increase the circumference of the vessel, in other words, its diameter. You also had, oh, let's, let me write the equation for this. P 
PD over 2T. We'll talk about what you do with the thickness in just a second. Um, you also have sigma A called axial stress. This tends to increase the length of the vessel. So if I draw the vessel here to show these stresses, sigma A acts like that, and sigma T acts like that. The magnitude of sigma A is half of sigma T. And of course, you can show that by taking two sections and writing equilibrium equations. If I have an element, if I want to draw these on an element, like so, let's call that sigma A. Drives with the picture on top. So I've drawn these as principal stresses. How do I know these are principal stresses? Yeah, but that's the way I do it. If I put a shear stress there, there'll be shear stress there, right? How do I know not to draw a shear stress here? How do I know these are principal stresses? Okay, saying, oh, uh, let, me, let me backtrack a little bit and, and mention something so no confusion will take place here. When you say there is no shear stress, you have to qualify that. There's no shear stress on these planes, right? There is shear stress on other planes. Agreed? Because if I draw a more circle for this very quickly, there is sigma t. There is shear stress. Just not on these planes, the way I have drawn them. But how do I know to draw it like that? One more time, please. The outside diameter gets larger, and so does the length. What does shear stress do to a material? How does it deform a material? What kind of deformation does it produce? change of shape or angular deformation, right? Think of it this way. We draw a little element here, and after we pressurize it, we take a look at the angles of that element. And they will be 90 degrees, right? You can, you can see that that's what's going to happen, just like a balloon that you blow up. If you can think of a square with curved sides on a balloon, it's going to remain a square with curved sides. When you blow it up, it's just going to be larger. That's all. Angles will not change. So no shear stress. That's how we know. OK? So tangential and normal, uh, sorry, tangential and axial uh, stresses. And these are the equations. Your book brings in some maximum value of this. And let me show you. Uh, I guess in order for me to be correct, I should do this too, right? This is a thin walled vessel, so it can't be full. Uh, <clears throat> your book brings in some maximum value of the stress, and this is what they mean by that. If I look at this cross section, and let's, for the time being, let's assume that this is thin walled. Uh, the way we find the stresses in reality is that the tangential stress here is maximum 
and it varies like that. When it goes to the outside, it becomes minimum. Not zero, minimum. Everybody understands what I've drawn there? Everybody okay with that? If not, please tell me, because once you tell me that you understand these, then it becomes kosher for quiz. The variation between this maximum and minimum, if the wall thickness is small, is very, very small. So we essentially assume that there is no variation and use these equations and assume there's a constant. In other words, we assume the stress distribution is like this. A little bit smaller than the larger one, a little bit larger than the smaller one. The average value of the stress. Uh, your book actually calculates this value by bringing in T, the thickness and all of that. I don't think that's necessary uh, because if you want to treat it like that, then you shouldn't treat it as a thin wall cylinder. Treat it as a thick wall cylinder and as we will see uh, very shortly, you can get very good values from the equations of uh, thick wall cylinders. So that's thin wall cylinders. Any questions? <coughs> All right, let's take a break and when you come back, I will take a look at thick walled cylinders. Okay. <clears throat> Now we take a look at thick walled vessels and pipes. Again, the only difference is that in one case you will have a, um, an axial stress in vessels. The length of the uh, vessel will change. The other one you will not. The length of the vessel does not change. Um, save for, of course, the effects of Poisson's ratio, which for the time being we're neglecting. A pressure vessel, such as you can see on the screen, in cross-section, uh, can be pressurized both from the inside with a pressure PI and from the outside with a pressure PO. For example, if you have a pipe that has fluid running through it and the pipe is housed in another vessel, which is pressurized, then you have both internal pressure and external pressure. So this is the most um, general type of pressurizing a vessel or pipe. Uh, the stresses that are set up here, uh, very similar to the uh, thin walled pressure vessels, and Actually, for thin walled, let me say something else that, of course, we are neglecting. That's why I didn't refer to it, but we're not going to neglect it here. Uh, so the hoop stress is like so. The tensile stress goes into the board, right? Uh, sorry, not the tensile. It is tensile, but the axial. The axial stress goes into the board. Um, is there a uh, stress in this direction? in thin walled pressure vessels, or thick walled for that matter, it doesn't matter. There is. What is it equal to? The pressure, that's right. Remember, pressure is force divided by the area, so is the stress. Yes, there is a pressure here that creates what is called a radial stress. It's in the direction of the radius. Everybody follows that? Same as what you see there? Radial stress, direction of the radius. But neglecting that stress introduces very, very small errors in calculations 
for thin-walled cylinders. Not so for thick-walled cylinders. Okay. So for these cylinders, what we are going to do and what we're looking at, let me redraw that here. We will take an element such as this. And if you take a look at it, in the plane that I'm showing the element in, there are two types of stresses. One acting on this plane. That's the tangential stress, or the hoop stress. Very similar to thin wall. And another one, sigma r, in the direction of the radius. Does everybody follow what I have on the board? The picture, does it make sense? The radial stress tends to change the thickness of the vessel. The hoop stress tends to change the diameter or the circumference of the vessel. <clears throat> there is, of course, if if we have a vessel and it's capped, of course, there is a stress in the third direction. So there is a stress on this plane as well into the board. So uh, actually, it's out of the board. So I'll show it like that. It's a tensile stress. That's like an arrow coming out. If it were a compressive stress, I would show it like this. An arrow going in. That's one way of showing stress, three-dimensional stress on a two-dimensional board. Uh, <clears throat> these are the two stresses that we will look at extensively here. And uh, to do that, uh, you, can, you can do that, of course, taking an element like this too, finding out how much change there is in its circumference, and from that to get to the stresses. But um, this is done using theory of elasticity. And since we are not going to do that here, we're just going to give you the results. And these are the results. And let me put them, yeah, I'll put them over here, so I'm going to keep them for a while. The tangential stress is equal to pi ri squared minus po ro squared minus ri squared ro squared times po minus pi over r squared divided by ro squared minus ri squared. The radial stress, pi ri squared minus po RO squared, these equations are in your book, plus RI squared RO squared times PO minus PI over R squared all over RO squared minus RI squared. In these equations, Pi is the internal pressure. Po is the external pressure. Ri is the inner radius. Ro is the outer radius. What's R? These are general equations for 
the tangential and radial stress, and they apply to all of the points between these two. So R is that. It's a general radius. So if you want, for example, the stresses right in the middle of the thickness, for whatever reason, R is equal to Ri plus Ro over 2. Average value of R. Is everybody following that? Like an X, it's like a variable. So whatever point you're interested in, R will be the radius at that point. If you would like to find the stress on the inner surface, did it die? Boy, today everything dies. Ah. Uh, if you would like to find the stresses here, R is equal to Ri. You want it on the outer surface? R equals Ro, and anywhere in between. General equations. There is, of course, if you're talking about a vessel, a, um, an axial stress as well, uh, but we generally don't take that into consideration unless it's really specified. Uh, the axial stress, we assume it is uniform. In other words, it doesn't change with R. It's the same on the inside, the outside, and every other point in between. In other words, when the vessel extends, it remains a cylinder. It doesn't go like this. That's what we mean by that. So <clears throat> if you plot these stresses, uh, actually, we don't have a plot of this. We have a plot of a special case of this. So uh, any questions on these before I go a step further? I know I have not proven that this is the case. Just told you to take that, take my word for it. Uh, it's actually not my word, is it? Uh, the people who did it. Uh, <clears throat> but you can, you can use that. And we're going to use it today as well, in a special case anyway. A special case that is used often in many of our, our applications is a case in which the external pressure is zero. And there's only an internal pressure. Most vessels are like that. Most pipes are like that. So if that's the case, for PO equal to 0, we get these rather simplified equations. Sigma t equals Ri squared Pi divided by Ro squared minus Ri squared times 1 plus Ro squared over Ri squared. Sigma r equals Ri squared Pi divided by Ro squared minus Ri squared times 1 minus R O squared over R I <coughs> squared. And for this special case, where we only have an internal pressure, the average axial stress is equal to Pi Ri squared divided by Ro squared minus Ri squared. So these are the stresses. Sorry, this is not Ri, this is R. Please correct that. So we need an R here. Can't do without R. On the other one, there is no R. Because that's an average stress. It's the same for all R's. So R doesn't appear there. 
Therefore, if we have a situation like this, we select an element at the most critical point. That means the point at which the stresses are maximum. If we plot these stresses, and this is only for internal pressure, if we plot these two equations, this is what we get. The tangential stress, which is a tensile stress, it's maximum at the inner surface and decreases as it goes out. Still remains tension, of course. The radial stress is compressive. <coughs> That's why it's plotted under here, under the line. It's compressive. But its magnitude is maximum here, and it drops off to 0 at the end. Because remember, sigma r is nothing but the pressure on the inner and the outer surface. On the inner surface is the internal pressure. On the outer surface is the external pressure. That's the stress in the radial direction. So if you only have an internal pressure, that's sigma r is equal to the internal pressure here, and it's equal to 0 there. So if you want that, you can actually come in here and say, I'll find the radial stress at r equals ri. That's the internal surface. Put it over here. We'll find minus pi. And if you want it at the outer surface, you set it equal to r o. And sorry, in this one, you set it equal to r o. And of course, you find 0, because there is no pressure on the outer surface. So that's your sigma r. The existence of this, uh, this compressive sigma r, this compressive radial stress, does it add to the shear stress or does it subtract from the shear stress? For example, if I compare this point to that point, the inner point, the outer point, which one do you think will give me the largest shear stress? Even if there is no very, even if that doesn't decrease, even if it stays constant, which it does not, of course, but even if it stays constant, which one of those two, and assume it stays constant, which one of those two would give me the maximum shear stress? The inside surface or the outside surface? Sorry? Well, let's take a look. What do we have on the outer surface? Again, more circle. Remember, you got to do more circle in many cases to get to these. What do we have on the outer surface? We have a sigma t and nothing else. Sigma r is 0. So your maximum shear stress is that. Correct? Everybody with me on this? You understand the Mohr circle and how I draw it? Now, inner surface. And let's assume this remains the same, so we can compare things correctly. So that's sigma t again. And then I have something over here, right? Sigma r is compressive. Now the maximum principal stress, sorry, the minimum principal stress is not zero, it's some negative number, and therefore I get a higher shear stress. Therefore, the most critical location is on the inner surface of this vessel for maximum shear stress, for yielding that is. And remember that that's what we calculate for yielding. So this is the most critical point. And most of our calculations are done there. And these are the equations that govern the uh, variation of the stresses. Any questions? One application 
of thick-walled pressure vessels is in press and shrink fits. Do you know what press and shrink fits are? And what the difference is between the two? No. OK, good. We'll go over it. Doesn't take very long. It's very simple. You can understand it very easily. Press and shrink fits, or shrink fits, is a way of connecting two parts that are transmitting torque. For example, if you have a shaft and a gear is sitting on that shaft, the gear load produces a torque. That torque needs to be transferred to the shaft, which rotates the shaft. You somehow have to connect the gear to the shaft. Of course, you can use a set screw. You can locate it by a shoulder and a set screw. You can do a keyhole and a keyway, a key and a keyhole, rather. And you can also do it by press and shrink it. What we do in the two, and here's, here's the definition of shrink fit. In order to put the two parts together, and now we call these collar and shaft, although they may be hubs of gears and whatnot. We call this the collar, and that's the shaft. In this case, a hollow shaft. Why, you, why would you like to have a hollow shaft anyway? Sorry? It is lighter. And at the same time, you're taking materials out of locations of minimal stress, right? Center of the shaft, minimal stress. And that's, that's true. That's one of the reasons why. But most likely, you're going to have to spend a lot more money making it a hollow shaft than you're going to gain by not paying for something as cheap as steel. Now, if you're talking titanium, that's a little bit different. So what would be another reason? Most of these shafts heat up in places where they work. So if you now are able to pass a fluid through this to cool the shaft, that would be one reason you would want a hollow shaft. They're not, they're not very common. You, you don't see them very often. But those are some of the reasons. But the reason for the stress preferably valid, and you do save weight. No question about that. In other words, if you put economy aside, that's a perfect answer. So in order to connect the two, here's what you do. You make the outside diameter of the shaft a little bit larger than the inside diameter of the collar. Then you heat the collar or cool the shaft or both, until the shaft fits inside of the collar relatively easily, like a running fit. You've had fits in 233, right? Fits and tolerances, no? Yeah, some of you at least have had it. A running fit is basically what it means. You put the shaft inside of the collar, and it easily moves within the collar. So a running fit. So you've heated up the collar, cooled the shaft, or both, and put the shaft inside of the collar. Now you let them come back to room temperature. The shaft would like to grow to its original size. The collar would like to shrink to its original size. Neither will be able to do that. And they end up somewhere in the middle. And by doing so, a pressure is set up between the two parts, which connects the two parts. That's called a shrink fit. A press fit is very similar. The result is very similar. But the procedure is like this. 
put a chamfer on the shaft, your color remains the same. So the tip of the shaft fits inside the collar, you press it in. You have to overcome the friction between the two parts. That's called the press fit. But the result is the same. The two parts are connected, pressure is set up between the two parts. The shaft will be in compression on the outside. The collar will be pressurized from the inside like this. And that is one of the applications of thick walled pressure vessels. <clears throat> if we can find, knowing, for example, what the difference is here, that difference, I'll, I'll draw another picture much better than this, hopefully. If we know what that difference is, that's a radial, what is called radial interference. If we know what that is, and using that, we can come up with the pressure that's set up inside or, or at the interface between the shaft and the collar. Then we can go in here and analyze the collar as though it just had a pressure inside of it using these equations. So the task, therefore, is to find a relationship between the interference, in this case, the radial interference, and the pressure that's set up between the two parts if we shrink or press it. Everybody understands what we're supposed to do, right? To come up with this, now your book just outright gives you these equations and says here, use them. You may like that. I don't. So this is in your handout. So let me draw a better picture here, or a bigger picture. I should have done that in the first place anyway. That's the center line of the shaft. And uh, the shaft could be hollow or solid. It doesn't matter. That's called delta, the radial interference. The difference between the outer radius of the inner member, the shaft, and the inner radius of the outer member, the collar. OK? So once press or shrink fitted, the shaft would like to come back to here. The collar would like to come back to here because it's now been pressed up somewhat, or moved somewhat because of, say, temperature. Neither will be able to do that. They end up somewhere in the middle. This is very similar to the indeterminate problems that you had in strength. So let us assume that eventually, when equilibrium comes about, This is where they end up.
Does that make sense? Shaft cannot go back to its original size. Color cannot go back to its original size. So they compromise. Then the color will have grown by that amount. We call it delta O. That's a radial change in the color. And the shaft will have decreased its radius by delta i. Anything you don't understand, please tell me. Therefore, and we design, when we design the, the interference, we actually come up with this, delta. What should delta be? I'll do an example problem. <coughs> As you can see, the magnitude of delta is equal to the magnitude of delta i plus the magnitude of delta o. Never mind that one is an increase and the other one is decrease. Magnitude. Therefore, that top, equa that top equation. OK? Now, we say the strain in the tangential direction in the outer member the outer member is the collar. The strain in the tangential member in the collar at the interface, because all of this is happening at the interface. The interface is called R, the radius of the interface, where they end up at the end. It's capital R. So let me go back to this to clarify all of this, and then we'll come back. Ri is the inner radius of the shaft. Ro is the outer radius of the collar. So if you have a solid shaft, Ri would be zero. The solid shaft. R is the radius of the interface, where they end up at the end. So in these equations that I'm about to write, this is the meaning of the various terms. Well, actually, I won't write them. I'll go through them here. So the strain, the tangential strain in the outer member. And remember, we have a state of stress such as this, tangential stress. That which changes the circumference is sigma t over e minus nu sigma r over e. Agreed? That's what you have here. Well, actually, no, I'm one step ahead of myself. Let's first do the geometry. The tangential strain at the interface for the outer member is the final circumference minus the initial circumference divided by the initial circumference. Agreed? Meaning of strain. The final circumference is calculated on the basis of R plus delta O. Actually, I've shown this. Let me show R to here at the original interface. I should show it to here. R plus delta O. The color has grown that much from its original dimension, whatever it was. So the circumference is 2 pi R. The original circumference was just 2 pi capital R. Divided by the original circumference gives you delta O over R. That's a strain. Therefore, the change in that radius delta O for the outer member is equal to R times epsilon T O from that equation. Now, 
we know epsilon t o is equal to sigma t divided by u minus nu times sigma r divided by u. This is your stress strain relationship in two dimensions. And we substitute here for, in this equation, for epsilon t o to come up with this equation. So you're wondering where all of this comes from. At the same time where we substituted that for this, we also substitute these stresses for sigma t and sigma r. This is from, for the outer member, outer member is under an internal pressure and those are the stresses for an internal pressure. So you put the stresses here from there, you put all of this over here, you solve for delta O and that's what you get. Any questions? Is there anything you don't understand? There's two or three steps here, but this is something you should understand. So we figured out what the strain was, from which we calculated the change of radius, then substituted for the strain in terms of the stresses, and substituted for the stresses in terms of the pressure. Because that's what we, want, we wanted to do. We wanted to find a relationship between the change of radius and the pressure. There's the pressure. But we've only done that for the outer member. This is not all of the interference, only part of the interference. We go through a similar process, exactly the same thing, this time for the shaft. We say, what's the strain in the shaft? Do exactly the same thing and come up with this equation. And notice that in here, we are using different, or different nomenclature, EO and nu O for the outer member, EI and nu I for the inner member, just in case they're not made of the same material, two different ones. And then, according to that equation, we add the two magnitudes to come up with delta. So there is the equation of delta as a function of pressure, or vice versa. If you have delta, you can find the pressure. If you have the pressure, you can find delta, whichever you like. And notice that there is nothing in there that we don't know. Material property, interface radius, outer radius of the outer member, interface radius, Poisson's ratio, same thing over here. If, this, if the two materials are the same, steel collar, steel shaft, then the nu O, E O, and all of those will be the same, will be E and nu, and the nu's actually will cancel out and you get a simplified equation such as that. That's if the collar and the shaft are made of the same material. Any questions? So, uh, given some sort of a torque, you should be able to come up with the uh, required interference. Or given the interference, you should be able to come up with the pressure and therefore the stresses and check for factor of safety and so on and so forth. Okay? Any questions? One more thing here briefly, that's rotating rings or disks, as the case may be. If this is, if this is a rotating ring or a disk, uh, due to the rotation, there will be changes in the dimensions of this, right? Just think of a very, very soft material that's rotating dimensions are going to change. Will there be any stresses in this if it rotates? Okay, think of it this way. You have a bungee cord in your hand. You put a weight at the end of the bungee cord and you rotate the bungee cord. What happens to the length of the bungee cord? It increases. Same thing here, it's just not a bungee cord due to normal component of acceleration, 
forces are set up that will change the circumference of the uh, disk as well as its thickness. If I take an element such as this here and want to draw the stresses on this element, what would be the difference between the stresses here and the stresses there? That for uh, vessel pressurized on the inside, this for a rotating ring. What happens to this thickness? Will it increase or will it decrease? So you, you think it won't change? OK, let me ask you a different question. Maybe you have heard this. Uh, it doesn't have to be a circle either. There's a hole here. Could be a square. We heat this. What happens to it? What happens to the hole? Will it get larger or will it get smaller? It will get larger. All dimensions increase. Now you may be thinking, well, this thing grows in all directions, so it's going to grow into this hole. Well, no, that's not the way it is. The hole actually grows. Same thing in here, except that it's not pressure. What you're doing is as though you're stretching this all over, meaning there'll be stretching of the circumference as well as the stretching of the thickness. So if you draw the element, that's the difference. Sigma r is tensile. It is not compressive. In that case, sigma r is compressive. That reduces the thickness. This increases the thickness. The equations for the stresses are in your book. I believe they're on page 129. Long and drawn out. I'm not going to write them. And as you would expect, they are a function of the normal component of acceleration, rho omega squared. Yes, uh, page 129, equations 355. And uh, you should just read those and make sure you understand what it says. Of course, you should not even try to memorize these equations. Okay. Any questions before we do example problems? All right, let's do problem 573. Even though this is chapter 3, the applications, I'm going to do a problem from five, chapter 5 so that we apply failure theories as well. Like I said, we should. So 573. It says a solid steel shaft has a uh, gear with ASTM 20 cast iron. Whose E equals 14.5 MSI. Shrink fitted to it. The shaft diameter is. Two point oh oh one plus or minus zero point zero 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 four inches, and the uh, hub is two point zero 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 plus zero point zero 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 four 
and minus 0 0.0000. With ID, uh, the specification for the gear hub R, 2 point uh, inches. Internal diameter, this is ID. OD for the hub, 4 plus or minus 130 second, yeah, 4.00. All in inches. Using the mid-range values and the modified Moore theory, estimate the factor of safety guarding against fracture in the gear hub due to the shrink fit. Uh, <clears throat> One point regarding what was just said is they say use the mid-range values. In other words, I would take this at 2.001 plus 0 0.004 minus 0 0.004, so it'd just be 2.001. That's a mid-range value. In reality, you should not be using mid-range values, but that's what the problem says. For this one, it would be 2.000 plus 0 0.004 and minus 0 0.000. And he says, using mid-range values, uh, find what the uh, sorry, let's read that over here. Uh, modified Moore theory estimate the factor of safety. Very good. So we have. This mid-range value is 2.001. That's for the diameter of the shaft. That is somewhat larger than the diameter of the collar. So this one would be minus. Uh, actually, I should write this as interference is equal to minus 2.002. Divided by 2, which could give you 0 0.0004 inches. Mid-range value of the diameter of the shaft, mid-range value of the diameter of the collar. The difference between the two divided by 2 gives you the radial interference. We have everything in terms of radial, so we do this in terms of radial as well. Radial interference. Then we have delta. Uh, actually, before we go there, is it good to take your mid-range values? If you really want to look for failure, you should you look at the worst case, not the middle case. You should look at the case where the shaft is the largest it can be and the collar is the smallest that it can be, because that will give you the maximum interference. But they say to use these, so we use these. If we now use that in the equation for delta, we can come up with P. So I'll just leave it up to you to show that this is equal to 2613 PSI from that equation. Uh, the uh, this is for the collar. The shaft is um, steel. Shaft steel. And for it, use E equals 30 MSI. And nu equals 0 0.292. For the collar, 14.5 MSI. Nu equals 0 0.211. Put them into that second equation from the bottom. Solve for p. You should you should actually uh, program these on your calculators. You don't want to do this every time you want to solve a problem. Program it and put the numbers in. So sigma t over there at 
R equal to Ri, most critical point, will get equal to 4355psi. Sigma R, of course, equals minus P. Once you have those two, you can easily solve for the factor of safety. Again, I'll let you do that. Factor of safety comes out to be 5.05 according to the modified, do they want modified more? Modified more, yes. Any questions? Okay, one more example problem. Uh, everybody is clear on what you should do to get to, I mean, you know what to do, how to get to this final answer. It's exactly the same as the previous problems we did. Once you find these two, don't forget that this is compression. And I should say something about the value of R, capital R. What do I substitute for capital R? Remember I had a sketch there, R was the initial radius plus delta O or some such thing or minus delta I and all of that. But remember that these are only what? 0. 0.0004? So for R, what do I substitute? I'll just substitute the radius of the shaft, period. Of course you can go ahead and substitute radius plus point oh so if the radius is two or one you get one point oh 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 four and figure out how much difference that makes in your calculations and the answer is none because we generally don't go more than three significant figures anyway so don't try to figure out should i use this plus plus point oh four minus point oh it's the interface radius it's the nominal radius of the shaft or the collar before you do any shrink or press fitting. That's the interface radius. Okay? All right. Let's take a quick look at this problem and call it a day. This is in your handout again. And this is the type of problem that you should be able to do. Nobody gives you the stresses outright. Or the, or the interference. So this problem says, and you can read it in your handout, a collar one inch thick and two inches long is to be designed for a 1018 cold drawn steel shaft to transmit a torque of 10,000 foot pounds. The collar and the four inch shaft are made of the same material and the coefficient of friction between them is 0.4. Calculate the precise dimensions of the collar, make all necessary checks. Minimum factor of safety, 1.5. And they give you E, nu, and uh, the yield strength of the material, and RO, R, and RI are also given. And if they were not given, you could, you could probably decipher it from the statement of the problem. First thing you have to do is convert this uh, business of uh, torque being transmitted into something that we can work with. In other words, the pressure. The torque comes from stresses or forces called tangential. So let me draw the shaft here. This is what I mean by FT. Friction forces between the shaft and the collar generate the torque. Where do friction forces come from? They come from normal forces. So that's what I mean by F and all of these combined. So the tangential force is the torque multiplied by 12 to get it in inches divided by the radius, Ft times R. 60,000 pounds. The normal force is that divided by the coefficient of friction. Ft equals mu Fn. 
so 150,000 pounds. Pressure, therefore, is 150,000 divided by the area on which it acts. The area is the area of the shaft It's this area. Agreed? That's where the pressure acts. Divided by that area, as that you get the actual pressure. Divide the force by that area, that is. Then use the equation for delta that I just had up on the board. Everything is given here. You've just found P. You find the radial interference. Multiply it by 2. You get the uh, diametral interference. And therefore, the interference should be approximately three thousandths of an inch. Now you have this. The problem would be over if you didn't have to check anything else. But you got to make sure that the collar can take all of this pressure and not yield. So, sigma t, sigma r. These are exactly the same equations we just used, and they're all calculated at the interface. That's where the stresses are maximum. So this is all for the interface. When we have those two, then we can find them. And I've given you maximum normal stress theory to see how far off it is. Maximum normal stress, yield strength divided by the maximum stress, three and a half. Maximum shear stress requires the value of tau max. So there's tau max, sigma x minus sigma min divided by two, 10.7. And the maximum shear stress theory gives you two and a half, so this is okay because we needed one and a half. A maximum distortion energy gives you 2.8, and that we've done before. So that's a little bit larger than that, and that's what we would expect. You would expect it to be a little bit larger or the same, at a maximum the same. A couple of things we have. Um, neglected here. One is the actual shear stresses that transfer the torque. We said there are no shear stresses, so we've neglected that. And at the edge of the collar and the shaft, there will be some stress concentration because of the collar pressing on the shaft. We have neglected that as well. So. Take a look at this. If you have any issues with this, this is the type of problem that you should be very comfortable with. So if you have any issues with this, please let me know first thing next time. I'll see you on Thursday.